may consider you from time to time? Or that you are a single drop in a vast ocean of humanity and God cares for all of it? There are billions of lives, billions of stories. Can we really believe he has great destinies planned for all of them? Surely the ruler of the universe has more important affairs than to notice the needs of one singular individual. But hear this, nothing could be further from the truth. When God says, I love you, it means that he crafted every detail of your being. Your every feature is his perfect design. His mind perceives your worries and your thoughts. His heart is broken by your pain. You are his child, created in his image. Your value exceeds all the riches of earth. Your worth extends beyond the stars. And though you may be unaware, he's carefully constructing the events of your life to build his kingdom. If you are willing, he can and will achieve wonders through your hands. It is the deepest passion, the most meaningful promise. It is your security, your hope, and your future. It is the truth beyond doubt. God loves you.
the trees that grow beside the waters, the animals that come to the stream to drink. It's all your work. You have created it. You gave us the sun which marks the days and the moon that marks the months. It all fits together like the workings of a clock. Then you gave us the ability to care for it all. You gave us the chance to care for each other. There is so much work to do, God. Help us to remember we do the work for you. If we cook, let us cook as though your son will be a guest at the table. If we paint, let us paint as though the picture will hang in your house. If we clean, let us clean as if your angels are coming to our home to dance. We will keep you in mind, God, in all things, in all we do. When we labor and when we rest, you created and you took a break. We will take this day and stop. We will breathe. We will appreciate the gifts you have given us. Our hands, our feet, our minds, our hearts. We will look around and see our lives as a gift. We will be grateful for the jobs we have. We will pray for those who cannot find work. We will reach out a hand to help those who cannot help themselves. We will be grateful for this day, this moment set aside to say thank you to the one who began a good work and continues that work in us. Amen. our kind of private idea that kids belong to their parents. I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. I don't really understand this idea that parents should decide what's being taught. I always viewed homeschooling as somewhat of a cult. Quiet, inclusive. The different people. Abnormal in some way. I could never picture myself doing it. Oh no, those are weird. I'm not doing that. That was before we had kids, and then we had kids, and... All of a sudden, time for school, and is this really what I should be doing? The kingdom of heaven is qualifying you to speak into your children's life. I'm responsible for what we're putting into their head and into their heart. It changed everything, and the freedom we had was so worth the small sacrifice it was to teach the kids. Now, 12 years later, I realized it wasn't a sacrifice, it was a total gift. You are in control. You get to choose curriculum, you get to choose methodology. It's yours to shape. You are the perfect person to teach them because you've been teaching your child since day one. She made sure I had everything I needed. I love her so much. No one's gonna love our children more than we do. The greatest gift that I was given was my own identity. My parents gave me that. Go in with an adventurous spirit. Break the mold. It's really beautiful outside the box. It's such a great adventure. Isn't homeschooling like public school at home? Ha! Ah, not even close.
to come on. worthy this morning church come on it's even good to us we are so so blessed i want to invite you we're going to sing this song one more time i'm going to ask the band just to be quiet we're going to lift our voices if you believe he is worthy he's worthy of our voices amen worthy of all that we are let's sing it one more time come on leo worthy is and worthy lift it up he's worthy You're a sweet sound in his ear singing. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Church, we have an incredible privilege this morning to pray over one of our missions teams that's going to the Dominican Republic. Isn't that awesome? So we're going to invite them to come at this time. You can remain in an attitude of worship. I'm actually going to invite Pastor Chris, who is our outreach pastor. Can you give it up for Pastor Chris? Let her know how much you love her. They took your mic. Honey, they give you a mic. You can take this mic. The folks coming up on stage are heading out on Saturday to the Dominican Republic. They are going to be building a brand new church in the town of Arbacoa on the northern end of the country. This is their first trip to the Dominican since COVID, so they are very excited to be there. Now, you might notice there's some folks in front, and they also have on Dominican shirts as well, but they have Prayer Warrior written on the back. Each team member chose two special people to be their prayer warriors. They have been in constant contact with each other, praying for this mission team, praying for the folks in Arbacoa that they're going to be meeting, and praying for this church. Today, we're going to get the chance to pray for this team as well. Amen. I'm actually going to invite, I don't see Bruce. Where is Sir Bryant? He is somewhere around here. He's 
helps with our missions team, helps plan them. He's probably hunting around. He's one of our elders. So if you see Bruce, give him a hug. There, there he is. Come on up, Bruce. Yeah, come on up. Would you help me welcome Bruce as he comes? It doesn't sound like he got the memo on the t-shirt, but he's, he still looks good, right? Actually, would you take your shirt off and give it to him for me? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Come on up here. And if you don't mind, you can just stick out those antennas towards this group just as a sign of support. Heavenly Father, we lift up this team to you right now. God, we pray for your hand on them. God, we pray for wisdom. We pray for God-ordained moments to take place. God, as they build this church, we know the message will go forth and lives will be changed. God, we thank you for what you're doing in our church and that we get to be a part of it. Have your hand on this team, Father. Safe travel in Jesus' name and in one loud FCF voice. We all said... Amen. Would you let them know how much you love and appreciate them? Why don't you give a high five to somebody that's worshiping with you? Say, I'm glad I'm in church today, and you can go out and have a seat. Good morning, FCF. We are excited this morning. It is a wonderful Sunday. We are so happy that you are here with us, especially if it's your first time. If it's your first time, we would love to welcome you. Can we take a minute and welcome our first time guests? Whether it's in person or online, we are so glad that you chose to spend your Sunday here with us. If it is your first time, we would love it if you would take a minute and fill out the Connect card, either on the program you got when you came in or fcfchurch.com. Just hit Connect. It'll help us get to know you a little bit better. Now, a couple things going on we wanted to tell you about. The first is that next Sunday we are having an information meeting for our homeschool ministry. Who's, yeah, come on, who loves the homeschool ministry here? I believe last, a couple weeks ago, they said it's the fastest growing ministry here at FCF Church. It is an amazing ministry, touching people's lives, helping families. If you want to be a part of it or you just want information for it for this next, this upcoming year, we would love for you to join us for the information meeting. It is next Sunday here at FCF in this auditorium right here after second service. Um, the only thing you need to know is if you want to have child care for that, we need you to register for it. So register at fcfchurch.com slash events. Other than that, show up, be here, get some info for the homeschool ministry. Uh, now also, we have another special thing, which is today, and today is Ice Cream Sunday. Yeah. So following service, as you leave, we'll tell you where it's going to be, but there's going to be free ice cream. Um, also, after second service, if you got people, if you're like, oh, I didn't know, invite people to come for second service. There is free ice cream. going to be outside so we can use the property, uh, hang out, and enjoy some great fellowship together. So we invite you to take part in that. Stuff your face with ice cream. <laughs> and here is Pastor Kim. All right. I think I'll use this one. Hey, good morning. I am very enthusiastic today about talking about giving like I do almost every Sunday. So here's the thing. When it comes to giving to a local church, it doesn't matter what local church you're giving to. There are three main things that your giving supports in any local church. Maintenance, ministry, and missions. Those are the three big parts. Every church has maintenance. You've got to pay your bills, right? And then there's ministries. It takes financial resources to run a children's ministry, a youth ministry, a worship ministry, and so forth. But then a healthy church also has missions. We as a church, we have chosen particular organizations and other churches around the world and even locally that we want to support. So we tithe off of our budget, we tithe and we give to other great organizations and ministries that are doing the work of God. So you saw the one, our work in the Dominican Republic, we give to an, or, um, a church in Peru, in Russia, the work that God is doing there. And then there's uh, the Barnabas Project that supports persecuted Christians around the world. Uh, there's Convoy of Hope that does disaster relief that we support. And then right here locally, the work of the Frederick Rescue Mission and the Religious Coalition. So when you give to FCF, you are also giving to each one of these other churches, ministries, and organizations doing the work of God. So if you want to give to these great things that God is doing in FCF Church and through FCF Church, we invite you as always to give on our website, on the app, or the offering boxes. So Pastor Randy, continues to enjoy a much deserved vacation does he not deserve for all that he does for us 
some time to rest and rejuvenate and I know that's what he's doing I talked to him this week and just the Lord is just strengthening him in this time away so we look forward as when he comes back uh, for all that how God's going to use him continue to use him and work through him but today Pastor Pete is bringing the message I'm super enthusiastic about that but now you guys know he likes to kind of give me a hard time doesn't he and he takes every opportunity he can to embarrass me doesn't he Pastor Pete, can you come up here, please? Pastor Pete. So I, I just feel like, you know, for all his teasing of me, that turnabout's fair play, right? So uh, check out this video. What? I got him. There's no video. Oh. I love you. <laughs> He's my best good friend. I love him. I'm super excited about his message on contentment today. You're in for a treat. Well, good morning. morning. Pastor Kim, wherever you are, that was not kind. That was very mean. I was uh, worshiping so demonstratively earlier that I actually worshiped the microphone right off my head and then broke it. So can you hear me okay? They had to swap my mic out real quick. Quick, Chris, if you don't mind, give me a tiny bit in the wedges would make me feel a little bit more comfortable. So, if this is your first time with us, we're so glad that you're here. My name is Pete, and I have the incredible privilege of serving here as the associate pastor and member of our teaching team. And the evil person that was up here earlier is Pastor Kim, and she's a good egg. She's just a little bit cracked. As <laughs> Pastor Randy, <laughs> Pastor Kim mentioned, Pastor Randy is away getting some vacation. Great churches are the result of great leaders. Amen. And we are blessed with an incredible founding pastor and leader. Can you let him know how much you love him, how much you appreciate him? And this is a holiday weekend and there is a ton of people here. I don't think, uh, did you guys need to know I was speaking? Is that what happened? Nobody told y'all? So if you're a first time guest, like I said, we'd love to meet you after service. There's an area called Guest Central over here, myself, some of our leadership team will be there. Can we let our first-time guests know how much we love and appreciate them? <laughs> Earlier this week, I, I went out to eat with my wife, Jessica, and, and uh, another couple, some friends of ours, and celebrating before they went, they took a trip to Italy. It's really cool, awesome. And we were sitting with them, and, and we went to this fancy restaurant. It was Fancy. It's one of these restaurants that only has four things on the menu. Have you seen this? And so, and so I get there and I, I say, I always ask, you know, what's good here? I hadn't eaten there in a long time. And the lady looks down her nose at me and says, sir, everything is good here. <laughs> oh, my bad. They brought out the, the hors d'oeuvres and they, they put them out. And there was two little things on the plate. And I thought, man, that looks delicious. I wonder what everyone else is going to eat. And I, I'm sitting there, I'm hungry. They bring my food, they put it right in front of me, and it looks phenomenal. It's like 12.45, a little later, you know, than I normally eat. And so I, I was like, man, I'm so hungry. And they put it in front of me, and it just looks so good. And then she takes Jessica's plate and puts it in front of Jessica. <laughs> oh. I look at my plate. Look at Jessica's plate. Has this happened to you before? 
I'm like, man, I wish I had gotten that. It looks so good. I was sad. I couldn't believe it. And I tried to hold myself together, compose myself. So I'm like, I'm fine. I'm sitting in a restaurant while someone prepares food and brings it to me while I wait in an air-conditioned room in a comfy chair, and I am not satisfied. Be honest. Be honest. You're in church. This has happened to you. Like, man, I wish I'd gotten that. Okay, all right. I'm not the only sinner here. That's great. <laughs> We're comfortable with that. <laughs> I don't think it happens just with food, though. I think this happens with all kinds of things. I, driving to church on 15, and all of a sudden traffic comes to a complete stop. You've been in this situation, right? Traffic comes to a stop, and then one lane starts moving. Doesn't matter where this is, one car in this lane decides, you know what? My lane choice wasn't great. I'm going to get in this lane. And so they cut off a car, and they get in that lane. And then what happens? It's <laughs> you guys have been here. So then the other lane starts moving. And then what do they do? They cut off another car. Back and forth, they go over and over again. And you're like, man, what are you doing? So it's confession time. I like, when I see somebody doing something crazy on the road, this drives my wife crazy. But if I see somebody doing something crazy, I want to see them. I want to understand, like, why would, I'm not going to, you know, give them the Christian single or anything. I just feel like if I can see them, I will understand what they're thinking. It doesn't work, though, just in case you're wondering. So I'm, I see this car driving all crazy on the way to church, and they're cutting people off. And, and I get a little closer, and I see an FCF sticker on the back of it. <laughs> I get right up next to the car, and the window's down, and worship music is blaring. It was Pastor Kim! <laughs> okay, none of that part was true. I just added it because she was making fun of me earlier. <laughs> But people just, they can't be content, right? This lane, that lane. Do you know this person that drives like this? Are you sitting next to the person that drives like this? Don't look at them, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Most importantly, are you this person? And I don't know why God, you, God brought you to church today, but I would suggest that the reason that he brought you to church today is for what I'm getting ready to tell you, okay? If you are this person and you're driving and you're in traffic, unless you have to get off an exit, be content in the lane that you're in. And everybody said? <laughs> We're in a series called God-Given Game-Changing Gifts. And this morning, I have the incredible privilege of talking about contentment. Turn with me to Philippians 4.10, and as you turn, I'm going to give you a little bit of context here, but first, I'm going to cough. One of the primary themes of this book is contentment and satisfaction. Paul planted a church about 10 years before this in Philippi of Macedonia, and this church supported him for, for an extended period of time, and then somehow, we're not actually sure why, but at some point, they stopped supporting him. Something happened in the church, and then they begin. They send somebody named Epaphroditus with a care package as an ambassador from the church to kind of thank him and to bless Paul, and that's where we pick up right here in Philippians 4, starting at verse 10. It says, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Verse 11. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I have, what is it? To be content, whatever the circumstance. Verse 12. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have the secret of being content. We're going to start this morning by looking at two common sources of cultural contentment. The reality is, as a culture, I don't care what study you look at, look at any of them, they all say the same thing. 
We are more blessed than we've ever been. And our culture is diseased with discontentment. It's like discontentment is intrinsic to our humanity. We can't shake it. Our houses 40 years ago were a thousand square foot smaller and our families were larger. And now our homes can't get bigger. We want more. Bigger, better, newer, nicer. Bigger, better, newer, nicer. What's the first place that we look for cultural contentment? Possessions. Money and possessions are the most natural, most common cultural pursuit in our effort to acquire, acquire personal contentment. We think if we, if we can somehow get enough that we'll find contentment, we'll find peace. Luke 12, 15 says it this way. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in abundance of, what is it? Contentment won't be found in possessions. Trying, trying to make more money and get more things in an effort to be content is like trying to put out a fire with gasoline. You are making it significantly worse. You're going to wear yourself out. And this is what Proverbs says. 23.4 says, Don't wear yourself, wear yourself out to become rich. Be wise enough to restrain yourself. Solomon says it this way. He was the wealthiest and one of the wisest people to ever live. And this man, I mean, he's getting real. He says, the more you have, the more people come to help you spend it. <laughs> Hashtag true story. We got to keep up with the Joneses, right? So we're trying to impress these people, trying to make it happen. The problem is the Joneses can't keep up with the Joneses. Truest and BB and T can't keep up with the Joneses. They're in so much debt. But we gotta, we, we're gonna make it happen. If I get bigger, better, newer, nicer, I can make this happen. And debt is so dangerous. <laughs> Just make 30 easy payments of $18. 472 easy payments of, of $19. They're easy payments. If the payments are so easy, you ready? You ready? If the payments are so easy, pay cash. Don't get yourself in a place where you're overcommitted. The average American, not on the East Coast, East Coast is, is worse, but the average American will spend over a quarter of a million dollars, $278,000, paying interest alone in their life. In this Pursuit of contentment through possessions. Some of the newest studies in reference to relational tension for the longest period of time. You know, I have a counseling psychology background. So my, my degree was in that. But it's been communication is the number one cause of divorce. Ah, but we have a new winner. And it's money. New studies are showing that money is the number one cause of divorce. It used to be until death do us part. Now it's until debt do us part. We can't satisfy ourselves, which by the way, we have a fantastic class called Financial Peace University. It's coming up in a couple of months. Sign up. If you are in this position and you feel like you're drowning, we want to help. We want to resource you. Possessions are a means to an end. Do you see how I, I, I have possess <coughs> highlighted? Do you know why that is? Because if you're not careful, they will own you. We own them. They shouldn't own us. Now, I'm also not saying that money isn't important because I've, I've heard teachings on this and I'm only going to talk about money for a couple minutes here, so... Oh, money's not important. That's not true. I've stood in this room to work and I've yelled, hallelujah. I still have to pay the light bill. It does not come on. We have three small buses that we use to sh shuttle people to our church. Can I give a shout out to our transportation team? Ms. Lisa Goodhart, <laughs> Scott Eisenagel, helping maintain the buses, Neil Krupp and coordinate. That team is incredible. Get involved. 
I've stood behind the buses and yelled, praise the Lord. <laughs> you got to put some gas in it. <laughs> it ain't got no gas in it. Well, P Pastor Pete, you know, the Bible says that money is evil. It's not what the Bible says. 1 Timothy 6, 10 says for the, what is it? Love. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So a natural question is, is it possible to be wealthy and not materialistic? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to show you how. We have this guide in Timothy. I love this. This is so simple. God made it so easy for us. Starting at verse 17. How? Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud, not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. You'll, you'll find that out real quick. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us all that we need for our enjoyment. Verse 18, tell them to use their money to do, what is it? They should be rich in good works and generous to all those in need. Always being ready to share with others. Four simple ways. Don't be proud of your money. Don't put your hope in your money. And use your money for good. Share it with others. Right there. Don't be proud of it. Don't put your hope in it. Use it for good and share it with others. The Bible does not condemn wealth. The Bible doesn't condemn possessions. The Bible opposes the love of possessions. There are people that are in this room that God has gifted you with the ability to create wealth. God has given you that as a gift. And many of these same individuals realize the incredible utility that money serves and the blessing that it is. I, I want to just pause for a second. This isn't in my message. I don't want you to think that in any way our church is in financial trouble. We are in the strongest financial position we've ever been in, which is why we are able to invest in ministries. We are able to allow the gospel to go forward without compromise. Amen, church? So this isn't a plea for money. This is not something, again, we want. <laughs> this isn't something we want from you. This is something we want for you. So I'm not, not going to like end by, and now take out your wallets, and that's not going to happen here. <laughs> but money can get a hold of you. A fifth of the time when Jesus spoke, he was talking about money. Money can get a hold of you. But money is a tool. At Christmas, we had a... Um, an issue with, with our soundboard. It was really, it was, we basically outgrew it. We, we, had, we had more musicians and instrumentalists than we had planned for, and it was fantastic. We had an issue with one of our microphones and created kind of this cascading effect where we had outgrown it. And after the service, I was talking with one of my friends and mentioned what had happened. And later that week, we were hanging out at our house, and um, they said, you know what, what do you need to do to fix this? And I said, well, we really need a new soundboard you know, it's only a couple years old and we can resell it, but we're not, you know, we weren't planning to do this this quick and we didn't plan for the growth to happen this fast. And, and the, the wife says, how much is it? And I, and I told her, it was more than I made in my first year in full-time ministry. And uh, she said, wow, that's, that's a lot of money. And she pulled out her computer, set it on my counter, and sent a check to the church. She said, I don't want, I don't want anything to ever prevent the gospel from going forth. And I walked over to her husband, who wasn't even in earshot of her, and was physically dominating my children, wrestling with my kids. And I said, your wife just wrote a check for X amount of dollars. Are you okay with that? And he said, he said, that's what money's there for. It's not my money, it's God's. And man, if we can get to the point that we realize, like, what, like, what is money? Money is seed. Sow it wisely. Why is this church so generous? Why is this one of the most generous churches that I've ever even heard of? Because people in this room realize there is no better place to invest your money than in the kingdom of God. Don't store up for yourself possessions. Moth and rust destroy. Thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself Treasures, if you know it, tell me. Treasures in? Great teaching from Pastor Kim on that. Man, it hurts to say that, but you are awesome, Pastor Kim. I love you. 
can't take it with you. But you can send it on ahead. I love that. I can't wait to show up in heaven. And hopefully see the lives that were changed by the people that gave in this church. By the people that invested in the kingdom of God. They were not saturated and consumed by the desire for more possessions. But they wanted to honor God. All right. The second place we look is positions. The first is our possessions. What can I get? And the second is our possessions. And this is the belief that success and achievement and personal accolades will lead to contentment. Man, if I had this job, man, then I'd be good. And if I was in this social group, if I could win this award, if I was at that company. But here's the problem. Culture defines success by how many people you lead and how much money you have. God defines success by how many people you serve and how much you give away. And this will never lead you to contentment. But when you serve and when you give, come on, you forget about yourself. There is a principle that takes place, not positions, but God, what, what do you have? What's your plan? What's your mission for my life? Turn with me. Turn with me to Mark 8, 31. Does anyone still have your Bible? If you do, I'm going to give you something in the bookstore. Go ahead and wave your Bible if you still have it at me. Uh, the first one I saw come up came right here. After service, Dan, you were a little slow on the draw there. You guys remember that? You used to sword drills. Remember you used to do that? Context of this passage, Jesus has performed incredible miracles. He's walked on water. He's fed the 5,000, fed the 4,000. Peter has just acknowledged the deity of Christ. Jesus responds by saying, flesh and blood is not revealed to you. So I'm going to build my church on you, Peter. The story pick up. Mark 8, 31. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the high priests, and the teachers of the law. He would be killed, but three days later, he would rise from the dead. As he talked about this openly with the disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. I'm going to read that sentence again in case you missed it. Peter, one of the disciples, took Jesus aside to correct him. He's like, he's like um, hey, Jesus. Hey, guys, we're back in one second, okay? He says, uh, look, this whole, like, suffer and die, like, suffer and, and, you know, things getting hard, like, it's kind of, it's just not a good look. It's a bad vibe. Like, we, we got a good thing going here. Like, like, attendance is good. Judas says giving is up. Can you? You're going to, Jesus, you're going to ruin this for us. Like, you got to just, look what Jesus does. I'm, I, can't, I, I can't help but see, like, these stories and how they played out. It says, Jesus turned around and looked at his disciples. So he's talking, he's talking with Peter. Peter's talking with him. And Peter says this, and he must be thinking, like, what on, like, he, Peter, I don't know where you are, but you're not where I am. And he turns and looks back at his disciples Looks at Peter. He says, get away from me, Satan. He said, you are seeing things merely from a, what is it? Point of view, not from God's. So Peter was sad that Jesus was saying he was going to suffer and die. What Peter had not yet even realized was that his mission and his purpose was going to be to do the same. Let's read on. Verse 34. Then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must, what is it? 
Give up your own way. Take up your, what is it? Cross. The only reason you take up your cross is what? You're going to die. And follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, man, I want to achieve position. I want to accomplish all that I can. You'll lose it. But if you give your life up for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. Come on, verse 36. What does it benefit? Some translations say profit. What does it profit? What does it benefit? If you gain the whole world and lose your soul. You can gain the entire world and it won't matter. It will not, it cannot make you content. I mean, this is a biblical perspective and we see it. But even in a secular and a godless perspective, it does not work. This is what this looks like. In the, this is the American way. In the first half of your life, you give up family and health for success and money. But if you live long enough to see this, in the second half of your life, you give up money and success to get your family and your health back. I could say it another way. In the first half of your life, you give up family and health, striving for positions and possessions. Then you spend the second half of your life fighting, giving up your possessions giving up your positions, and fighting to get your family and health back. Look, even if you win the rat race, you're still a rat. Just on that wheel going round and round in circles. Bigger, better, newer, nicer. Solomon says you are chasing the wind, but the, the faster you run towards it, the farther you'll be from it. You will never find contentment. In accolades or positions. Why? Because we were made for more. And our heart knows it. A ask any movie star. There's so many quotes on this. The most carry is, common is Jim Carrey, who says, I wish everyone could get all of their dreams, achieve everything they would want, so they would realize it's nothing. The challenge, the biggest challenge with positions and possessions is that they are relative. It's comparison based. So their possessions, their positions. Scripture tells us, 2 Corinthians 10, 12. We don't dare compare ourselves because it's not wise. We get in this compare and compete, and live in defeat, like we're just, we're a mess. We can't find contentment. But comparison... I feel, like, I feel like comparison is America's favorite indoor sport. <laughs> Walk in somebody's house and you're like, man, look at them floors. Whoo, they're so rich. Can't hide money. You can try. <laughs> Scripture tells us don't covet. It says, it says it's right up there with don't murder. God's top ten. Why? Is it because God... You know how God is, wet blanket, doesn't want any fun for us. He knows, he knows that it will destroy us. It is an unquenchable lust. You need to learn, not, things are nice, it's kind of a fancy stand there. Learn to admire without the desire to acquire. Come on, learn to, I should have put that in my notes. Josh, let's make that for a second service. <laughs> By the way, I want to do this real quick. This fits perfectly in the message. But there are people who aren't searching for personal accolades. They're not searching to get on a stage. They just want to honor God. And there is an incredible young man named Joshua Williams that does that consistently. And I love you, Joshua. For the glory of God, buddy. He spends hours and hours in this building for God's glory. And so the message goes forward without compromise. Desires that are inside you are not inherently bad. The desire for a wife is a good thing, Scripture says. The desire for your neighbor's wife is a bad thing. <laughs> I'm going to close with 
this section of the message with this. Contentment is not found in our possessions, what we can get. Contentment is found in God's provisions. He's our source. Contentment is not found in our positions. Contentment is found in God's plan and God's mission. Man, you will never be as, as satisfied as you would be if you were in the center of God's will. There is contentment and there is peace there. We're going to go back to the passage that we started with. Philippians 4.12. Verse 12, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have, what does it say? The secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or whole 30, whether living in plenty or in want. It's a little bit of a difficult message. Would you like some good news? Some of you, the rest of you. This side, would you like some good news? Yes. Yeah, all right, okay. When I see this, this portion of it, I'm like, oh, well, good. This can be learned. I mean, statistically, we are struggling with this and wrestling with this, but Paul says it can be learned. And it shouldn't surprise us that a lot of people don't know it, because what else does Paul call it? He says it twice. So I've learned the secret. It's not a personality that you are born with. It's a disposition that we can develop. Paul feels content while sitting in a jail cell. You can look back through Paul's life. I'm trying to be succinct here, but Paul was shipwrecked, beaten, beaten again, couldn't find food, hit with oil. I mean, all kinds of, if it, it's like you read a bad week. This is a bad, that was Paul. That was his life. And he was content. I love this. Oftentimes, God calls us to demonstrate an emotion that contradicts the circumstances that we find ourselves in. I, I don't really care what's going on. I'm content in you, Father. Paul is more content in a prison cell than some of us when our Wi-Fi is slow. So how do we do it? How do we get to a place that we're content? Well, first of all, we know we don't chase it. In Philippians 4, 9, he says, put into practice the things that you've seen me do. So I believe contentment isn't something that we chase. I think it's something that we practice. And I'm, I'm going to give you really quickly seven keys to contentment. And I said, look back through my life and all of the times that I was blowing it and realized I was discontent or frustrated, I linked it to one of these. Seven keys to contentment. Here's the first one. I'm going to start with all of them and then I'll, I'll put them back up if you want to take a picture. Keys to contentment. The first is you've got to recognize your source. And if you realize that God is your source, everything else can fade away. Three times in this specific chapter, he references God as the source. He says, rejoice in the Lord in 4.4. In 4.10, he says, rejoice greatly in the Lord. Philippians 4.19, he says, my God shall supply all of my needs in accordance with his riches in glory. He has to be our source. Press into him. I can tell you the seasons of my life when I was discontent and frustrated some instances I had drifted from my relationship with Christ I was not as close to him I wasn't living in open sin but I realized that I was I was just too busy the greater your level of intimacy with Christ the greater your personal contentment everything else can be moving around you and you can be content the second is this recognize your season like this, this was interesting because you go through different seasons of your life and you see different seasons in people's life and you're like, man, why, why are they there? Again, you shouldn't be comparing, period. But certainly don't compare your sowing season to someone else's harvest season. We need to learn to enjoy where we are on the way to where God is taking us. Amen? Don't compare. 
I've noticed that there's three things that happen when I ask for something. I'm thinking, man, this is going to, this is the thing. And I'm praying, I want three reasons why God doesn't answer a prayer for me, primarily. I ask for the wrong thing. It's not the right season. Oh, come on, he has something significantly better in store. And you may think that God is holding out on you or he doesn't want to give you, or maybe someone or something is stopping you from getting what you want or what you need. And what I will tell you is, if God wants to give you something, if God has something for you, no power in all of the universe can stop him from getting it to you. He will sustain you. He will give you all your needs. The next is recognize your sin. Man, recognize your need for a Savior. Now, a lot of churches, we don't even want to talk about this. No, we just want to talk about love. And we're broken. We're dinged up, Pastor Randy would say. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You can live for pleasure, but it's only going to last for a season. And you can't live this life outside of God's will and expect to be content. It will not happen. Recognize your source. Recognize your season. Recognize your sin. Recognize your stop. Look, this earth is not our home. This is not our resting place. You're never going to be completely satisfied here. Because God put a taste of heaven in every single one of us. You're like what, like, what do you mean by that? You could be in the most beautiful tropical environment with the love of your life, sitting there, and a fly will come and land in the middle of your soup. Because God put inside of us this desire for perfection. And that is what heaven is going to be like in his presence for all eternity. This earth is not our home. Recognize your stop. I love what David says in Psalm 17, 15. He says, but as for me, my contentment is not in wealth, but in seeing you and knowing all is well between us. And when I awake in heaven, I will be fully, what is it? For I will see you face to face. I'll give you four things to recognize. I'm going to give you three things to remember. First thing to remember is remember to rejoice. I said it earlier. Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Why does he say it twice? The wives are like, well, he was probably talking to a man with a man. You always have to say it twice. Y'all are never listening. <laughs> and all the husbands said, what would you say? <laughs> no, I think he says it twice because man, we forget. There are, there are things that we can forget, but we can't forget this. We're so blessed. Contentment is not the fulfillment of what you want, it's the realization of what you already have. We're so blessed. One of my, one of my buddies was going to pick up a go-kart from a guy. Married man with kids. Showed up to pick up the go-kart and gets, gets to the go-kart and, and the, the cowl is off of the side of it where the pool cord's supposed to be. There's nothing there. And he's like, what? He's like, why? Where's the, I didn't know there's no pool cord. He's like, no, I got it. He pulls the pool cord out of his pocket, wraps it around the engine and starts it. He's like, man, why don't you have it on there? He said, because... This is, this is what I was driving to work. And without the pull cord on it, it makes it harder for somebody to steal it. My man was wife and kids and was, was driving a go-kart to work. We are so blessed. So blessed. If you have change in your car, you're in the top 70% of people in the entire world. We're so blessed. Remember to rejoice. Remember to forgive. If, if I was transparent with you, I feel deep. I'm Italian. We, you know, we got the mm, 
the deep feels. This, this one, this one has gotten me from time to time. Where I'm not content because I feel like if somebody hurt me or somebody did something that was wrong. And to be honest, I could give you story after story. And you could give me story after story of when somebody hurt you and they did something wrong and it wasn't right and you didn't deserve it. And guess what? You still got to forgive them. Forgiveness is not saying what they did was okay. It's just saying that you're going to be okay. Resentment and contentment run in tension. They are mutually exclusive. You only get to pick one. You got to forgive. You got to let it go. Now, these six are very practical. They're, they're things that we want to keep in our mind, and they're kind of an overview. They're, they're almost like a device to help you focus when you're going through difficult times. But I'm going to be honest with you. This last one I'm going to give you, it trumps all of this. Like, this will help you navigate things mentally, but this last one is the most important, the number one key to contentment. And in reality, none of the rest of it even matters. This is all that matters. Recognize your source. Recognize your season. What season are you in? Man, if there's something wrong in your heart, get it out. Recognize your stop. Earth is not our home. Rejoice for what we have. Forgive those that have hurt you. And then finally, remember the mission. The devil, he doesn't even need you to turn your back on Christ. He just needs you to stay busy. He just needs you to stay in the pursuit of more. And as long as, and as, long as he does that, you're, you're off mission. 2 Corinthians 4, 18 says this, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporal or temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Contentment is not found in the real, excuse me, contentment is found in the realization that this life is temporal and your purpose here is missional. Contentment is found in the realization that this life is temporal and your purpose here is missional. Personal contentment is found in missional fulfillment. If you, if you know what you're supposed to be doing and where you're supposed to be going, you can be in the middle of a war zone and you can have contentment because you are fulfilling the mission. There's not a point when a soldier says, you know, I thought we were staying in the Hilton today. It looks like we're in some tents. The AC is a little more balmy than I expected. This, this humidity is getting to me. No, a soldier is laser focused on the mission. He's focused on what's most important. Would you like to hear what I think is one of the best pictures of personal contentment being found in missional fulfillment? It's in Acts 20, 22. And now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem. This is a This is a real man that's experienced Christ in such an impactful way that he's willing to lay down his life for it. This is a real man writing this, sitting. And now I'm compelled by the Spirit. I'm going to Jerusalem not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. However, 
I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race, complete the task that God has given me. God, what's your mission for me? The task, here it is, testifying to the good news of the grace of God. And we gotta get to a place that we don't care about anything else. Bigger, better, newer, nicer. I don't, I don't care what car I drive. God, I don't, I don't care how I dress. God, I just, I want to fulfill the mission. I want your purpose to be established in my life. I don't want to show up in heaven alone. Man, I want, we should want to bust into heaven. God, for your glory. Missional contentment. You want, you want contentment? You're only going to find it in one place. Missional fulfillment. Personal contentment is found in missional fulfillment. Stand to your feet with me. Heavenly Father, we realize that this is something inside of us that does not come naturally to us. But God, it's something that we want to learn. God, we want that heart that Paul has. Consider our lives worth nothing, but that we would fulfill the mission. God, help us to be content in the world that we live in because we know that that's what's most important. That is what is eternal. It's not temporal. It's eternal. Stir in our hearts this conviction. Help us to see what is eternal. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Come on, let's sing this together. Come on, he's all that we need. I can be content. And I will be content in every circumstance. You are Sing it again, just like that. Lift your voices. Sing, sing it out. Bad Ronnie. What a fantastic message, am I right? Don't we love Pastor Pete? Well, I'm in the wrong spot. <laughs> we are so happy that you are here with us. We have ice cream following when you leave service. If you want, there's four different flavors. We would love for you to join us there for some ice cream. And if you would like to meet Pastor Pete, talk with him, tell him how much you love this message. If it is your first time, we would love for you to exit through Guest Central. And if you need somebody to pray with you, spend some time with you, we would love for you to exit through Care Central. Have a wonderful Sunday. Go get some ice cream. <laughs>